This Parsha podcast is dedicated in honor of two Jenikov birthdays. Happy birthday, Dr. Lisa Jenikov, and happy birthday to her son, Max, soon to be Dr. Max Jenikov. May the Almighty bless them with joy and insight on these auspicious days, and may they experience many happy and healthy returns. Well, I'm back. It's great to be in front of a microphone. This is the longest time I've gone without recording a podcast in many years. As I mentioned last time, I traveled to Israel last week with my boys. So we pre-recorded Parshas Chukas. And this week is Parshas Balak. It's been more than 10 days since we recorded. I'm a bit rusty. Please forgive me if it's not quite up to par, up to speed. It's been a long time, but it's great to be back. It's great to be here in the Torch Center North for Parshas Balak. So let's begin. Parshas Balak is one of the most interesting and unusual Parshios. The entire narrative, almost the entire narrative of our Parsha is told from the viewpoint of our enemies. After the stunning victory of the Jewish nation over their foes on the east bank of the Jordan, Balak, the king of Moab, resorts to unconventional warfare to stave off the Jewish juggernaut. And he hires the famous sorcerer and prophet of the nations. He hires Bilaam to curse the nation. So you have two people here, the two I guess, antagonists of the Jewish people in our parasha. Balak, the king of Moab, and the inconveniently similarly named Bilaam, the sorcerer, the prophet, who he hires, who he commissions, who Balak commissions to curse the nation. Now, Bilaam is one of the worst villains of our history. The Talmud tells us that he's one of the few people mentioned by name who don't have a portion in the world to come. And the Mishnah tells us, this is in the chapters of our fathers, Petrovus chapter 5, the Mishnah tells us that he is the antithesis of Abraham. There are three sterling qualities that all the students of Abraham share. If you have a good eye, if you have a humble spirit, if you are content with your lot, then you are de facto a student, a pupil, a disciple of Abraham. And if you have the three opposite qualities, if you have a bad eye, if you have a haughty spirit, if you are rapacious, then you are de facto a student, a disciple, a pupil of Bilaam. The person who most embodies the opposite of righteousness and piety and kindliness the one who most represents the opposite of Abraham is Bilaam. And this is the guy commissioned by Balak, king of Moab, to curse the Jewish people. Now, the Pasha starts off with his courtship of Bilaam. He sends multiple delegations to woo him. They finally agree to terms. And Bilaam travels to the front lines to go curse the Jewish nation. The trip is quite memorable. There's an angel who sent to stop him, to prevent him from consummating his plans. And the donkey upon which Bilaam is riding sees the angel, but Bilaam does not. And the donkey tries to sidestep the sword brandishing angel. And Bilaam hits the donkey and they have a conversation and the donkey rebukes Bilaam, but eventually Bilaam arrives at the site, at the front lines, and he meets Balak. And Balak is told to prepare sacrifices. And there's a really interesting Talmud. It's almost unbelievable. It's almost unimaginable. But the Talmud makes a very interesting comment about the sacrifices and the altars of Balak. Now, our Parsha is an attempted genocide of the Jewish people. What would have happened had Bilaam succeeded in his curse? So the Talmud tells us that had Bilaam succeeded in his curse, spoiler alert, he failed. 
But had he succeeded, there would be nothing left of the Jewish people. The Talmud even says that Bilam is Laban-esque. Laban, Jacob's father-in-law, he wanted to uproot everything to destroy the entirety of the nation. So too Bilam. And who's hiring Bilam? Who's commissioning Bilam to go destroy completely the nation? Balak. So Balak is this terrible guy. Yet he's bringing sacrifices to offer them to God to try to lobby God to agree to the curses of Bilam. And the Talmud says something stunning. This is the unbelievable Talmud. The Talmud says in the book of Nazar, page 23b, that from the story of Balak, we learn a very important lesson, that a person should do a mitzvah and study Torah even with imperfect intentions. Even if you have other intentions besides for just doing the will of God. You have other reasons why you're doing good things, mitzvah, studying Torah. It's still a good thing. And what's the evidence of that? The evidence is from Balak, who did a mitzvah in our parsha to offer sacrifices to God, albeit with the most corrupt and genocidal intentions. He did it because he wanted to beseech God to destroy the nation. But nevertheless, he did something good. He did a mitzvah. And as a result of that, he merited a very special descendant. Balak is the great grandfather of Ruth the Moabite. So Balak is the king of Moab and his great granddaughter is Ruth the Moabite. And Ruth is the great grandmother of King David. And thus, Balak is the forefather of Ruth, of David, of Solomon, of Messiah. Some really crazy mind-bending genealogy here. And why did Balak merit to have such illustrious and consequential descendants? says the Talmud, because he offered sacrifices, because he did a mitzvah, albeit, like we said, with the most foul intentions, but he did a mitzvah, and the power of a mitzvah, even if it's done imperfectly, is that it can have tremendous generational consequences for the positive, unbelievable point that we will yet revisit. So Balak is bringing sacrifices, and Bilaam gears up to unleash a salvo of horrid curses against the Jewish people. But God compels him to bless the nation nonetheless. And these are not just any generic blessings. These are amazing, iconic blessings that the Talmud says are really worthy of being repeated every single day. It would just make the prayer too long, so it's not included, but the powerful blessings that Bilaam conveyed, are really worthy of saying every day. And Balak, of course, is annoyed. He hired Bilaam to curse the nation. Now Bilaam has blessed the nation. They try again with the same result, and they try again with the same result. Bilaam ultimately gives four exquisite blessings before he is sent home in ignominy. And the parasha concludes with somewhat of an oblique turn. It tells us how the Jewish men started cohabiting with the Moabite women. And they begin to worship their execrable deity. And God tells Moshe to execute the perpetrators, which he does. And then there's one particularly egregious offender, a man who is none other than the head of the tribe of Shimon. And he is publicly cohabiting with the Midianite princess. And that triggers a plague. And Pinchas, the son of Elazar, the Kohen, the grandson of Aaron, heroically and fearlessly, zealously assassinates the two, skewering them together like a kebab with a spear. And the plague ends but not before it kills 24,000. 
And the Ramban tells us that had Pinchas not done what he did, the entire nation would have been swept away in this plague. And thus concludes our Parsha. And next week, it picks up with the aftermath of the story where Pinchas is lauded for his gallantry, for his zealotry, and he's promoted to being a Kohen for his deed, and he is given an eternal covenant of peace. But that is for next week's Parsha. And this week, we have to focus on Parsha's Balak. So it's a really interesting Parsha with all kinds of salacious storylines to dig into. But let's begin with the end of the Parsha. Parsha starts off with the whole saga of Bilaam. Bilaam and Balak, and they're trying to curse the Jewish people, and they fail, and there's a talking donkey, and there's the whole negotiations of the various delegations that Balak sends, and all these effusive blessings that Bilaam is forced to give. And the Parsha ends with the seemingly unrelated story of the Jewish men cohabiting with the Moabite women and worshipping their deities. So Rashi explains to us this somewhat awkward transition. Rashi says that this really is part of the Bilam story. Bilam, when he was unsuccessful at cursing the Jewish people, he gave Balak a suggestion. He gave him some advice. And he said to him, well, the God of these, the God of the Jewish people, hates promiscuity. I can't curse them. We can't destroy them in that fashion, but let's allow them to destroy themselves by availing our daughters to be promiscuous with their men, and that will allow us a window, an opening to destroy this people. When Bilaam was unable to curse the people, he gave advice that would bring about their destruction. And the Talmud actually gives the whole elaborate scheme that they hatched to seduce the Jews. And ultimately, it seems like it worked. Bilam and Balak, they did marginally succeed in their efforts to decimate the people, but would have done much more damage absent the decisive action of Pinchas. So accordingly, the entire Parsha is really the story of Balak and Bilam and their efforts to try to destroy the nation, and when they were making some headway, Pinchas thwarted their plans. Pinchas ended the plague that they had perpetrated. Now, it's interesting, Pinchas and Bilaam, they appear again in our story. In a couple of weeks, we're going to read about how the Jewish people managed to exact revenge against Bilaam. Chapter 31, verse 8, Bilaam is going to be executed by the sword for his crimes. Who killed him? The Talmud tells us that Pinchas killed him. So we have two forces, so to speak. Bilaam trying to destroy the Jewish people, Pinchas saving them, and they visit with each other again. Ultimately, Pinchas triumphs. And I think if we study the modi operandi of these two respective combatants in our parasha, Bilaam, the evil sorcerer prophet of the Gentiles, trying to destroy the people, destroy the nation, and Pinchas with his zealotry and gallantry saving them, we find something really interesting about these two, and that will help us see what I think is an incredible idea, a life-changing idea that appears in a few different ways in our parasha, but really is a global idea, one of those transformative ideas that could really genuinely change your life. And I'm saying that from experience because I recently had a conversation with someone who told me that this idea changes life. What are the differences between Pinchas and Bilaam? And let's start off with Bilaam himself. He is a prophet. He is the prophet of the nations. He is a sorcerer. And he had the ability, ostensibly, to curse and to bless. And that's why he was hired. 
But the Talmud gives us some more insight into Bilaam's ability to curse. The Talmud looks at verse 8 of chapter 23. This is in the middle of his attempt at curses. He was forced to bless, even though he tried to curse. So the verse says, Ma ekov lo kabael. How can I curse if God is not cursing? How can I get angry when God is not angry? Bilaam was stymied in his effort to try to curse the Jewish people because God didn't agree. Bilaam's ability to curse was contingent on God's wrath, on God's cursing. What does that mean? It explains the Talmud that Bilaam really did not have any special insight or capacity to curse. What he knew was the following secret. What does it mean that Bilaam knew the knowledge of God? He knew that there was a moment every day when God unleashed some wrath. There was some expression of divine anger every day for a fleeting moment, a fleeting second, God gets angry, says the Talmud. And Bilaam knew how to pinpoint that precise moment and he would wait for that propitious moment to come and he would pounce upon it and he would channel it and he would use that moment to curse the nation. And the Talmud says that during the entire saga of Bilaam, God temporarily suspended his practice of getting angry, of having wrath every day. And that's why Bilaam says, I can't curse them because God's not angry. God's not cursing them. God has no expression of wrath. And therefore, my usual shtick of finding this time where there's this divine anger and wrath and channeling that and directing that for a curse, it doesn't work today. I cannot curse this people. And the Talmud says, had God, as is typically done, had God have an, had an expression of anger during this time, Bilaam would have seized upon it, pounced upon it, and cursed the Jewish people leaving the absolute destruction in his wake. That was the power of Bilaam's curse. There is a moment every day, a fleeting moment, when God is angry. What that means, I don't know. It's possible that it has something to do with the fact that there is a slight element of divine judgment still present in the world. The Talmud tells us that there is a quality or, or an attribute of God called strict divine judgment that's so severe and exacting that even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the titans, the most righteous of our people, cannot withstand such withering judgment. And even though the Almighty does not typically interface with the world using that system of divine judgment. Nevertheless, there is a moment of it every day. And at that moment, that is the time, the propitious time, that curses land. And Bilaam's superpower was that he was able to identify and isolate that moment when God was angry, whatever that means, and use that moment to curse. Now, when is that moment? So the Talmud very helpfully tells us that if you look at a rooster during the first three hours of the day, when the crest of the rooster is white because of the sun and it's white absent any red streaks, for that moment, that's the moment when God has this typical daily moment expression of wrath. And the Talmud relates an amusing story. There was one of the great rabbis, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, and there was a heretic who would drive the great rabbi crazy. 
And the great rabbi said, okay, give me a rooster. Let me examine the rooster. And the second that the crest of the rooster gets completely white without any streaks of, of red, I'm going to curse this individual. And he was watching the rooster waiting. And when the moment was about to arrive, he fell asleep. He dozed off. And when he woke up, it was too late. And he says, okay, this is a divine message. That This is not the way we're supposed to do it. Cursing our enemies is not our way. That's this idea of a divine moment of wrath that Balaam was able to channel, he was able to pinpoint it and to channel it, and that's how he cursed. And during the time of this whole saga of Balaam, God temporarily suspended this practice of having a moment of anger every day because otherwise, Bilaam's curses would have landed with catastrophic consequences for the subjects of his curse. So obviously, this is a subject that demands an explanation. What does it mean, this daily moment of rage, of anger, of wrath? What does it do with the white crest, absent any red streaks of the rooster? But let's focus on what this tells us about Bilaam. God gets angry every day for a fleeting second. But hey, we survive. We're not destroyed. From God's perspective, that moment of wrath is contained. It's a discreet, isolated, siloed off moment. Bilaam's cursing ability was his ability to take that moment, that point of wrath, and to expand it and to channel it. And to take it from being just a point of wrath to make it one that causes total destruction. He was able to pinpoint the slightest point of vulnerability, the moment, the fleeting moment of wrath, and transform that little point into a curse that destroyed not just the point, it destroyed everything. Bilaam, in this context, reminds me of of cancer. There's this one rogue, misbehaving cell. Out of trillions. A tiny little point of a problem of wrath in the enormous ecosystem of a body. But what happens, for some reason, that problematic point metastasizes and expands and it spreads until it destroys everything good, everything that was good and productive and useful and helpful, it's all destroyed due to what started off as being just one little point. That's what Billum did. He found this this moment, this fleeting moment, this slight point of a curse, of rage, of wrath. And he was able to metastasize it and spread it out and expand it and augment it until it took over everything and destroyed everything. And our whole parsha is really a story of Bilaam probing the people, trying to find any point of vulnerability that he could seize upon and fan and flesh out and augment into total destruction. And the whole power shows him failing. God didn't get angry. He looks at the nation and he sees that their roots are strong. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are unmovable, unflinching mountains. And then when the first angel, the first vantage point doesn't yield any fruits, He tries to see the nation from a different point, from a different angle. Maybe there could be some point of vulnerability. Maybe there's an opening, a window to land the curse, to work your magic and expand that little point of wrath into total destruction. And he looks at the nation and he says, there's no sin in Jacob. There's no iniquity in Israel. There's no point of vulnerability to land a punch. There's no rogue cell to metastasize. Let's change the angel again. Let's go to a different mountain. Let's see the nation from a different vantage point. 
Matovu Ohalecha Yankov, how goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. For the duration of Bilam's exploration of the nation, he's examining the people from every angle, searching, seeking to find some point of vulnerability, and he's not able to do so. The Torah tells us that Bilam was a one eyed jack. He had only one eye. He refused to see the full picture. He was looking for only one thing. He was looking intently for this point of vulnerability, to find the flaw, to find the bad. And of course, his intent was that once you find that point, he was going to draw it out. He was going to expand it, to metastasize it, resulting in the total destruction of the people. Now, you compare this to Abraham. Of course, the mission tells us that Bilaam is the opposite of Abraham. What was Abraham trying to do? This nation that Bilaam was trying to curse was a completely righteous nation. And he was trying to find a flaw, a liability in this nation. Abraham was the opposite. He looked at a nation, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, completely corrupted people, and he was trying to find one minuscule point of righteousness. Maybe there are only 50 righteous people in this entire metropolis. What about 45? What about 40? What about 30? What about 20? What about 10? Whereas Bilaam was seeking a foothold of weakness, of vulnerability, of sin, to expand and to kill the entirety of the nation, Abraham was the opposite. If there was a foothold of goodness, of righteousness, Abraham would do a reverse Bilaam, he would expand that into total salvation. Bilaam is a cancer, a point of death spreading to kill everything good. Abraham is like an elixir of life, spreading life and salvation and goodness with one little point to a completely stricken body. You know, this reminds me of the Luz bone that we talked about a few months ago. The Luz bone from which resurrection stems. And we explained in the past that everyone has this bone called the loose bone that never dies. And that one point of eternal life can spread to result in a resurrection of the entirety of the dead body. Bilaam's the opposite. He finds that one point of death and he uses that to kill an otherwise living and vital and healthy body. Abraham is like the loose bone, spreading life and goodness with one little point to an otherwise dead body. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic asking a physician friend of mine, is there the ability to have like a reverse virus? Instead of someone with the virus coughing and now spreading this virus to everyone else, let's give one guy the vaccine and let have him cough on everyone and suddenly there's life. There is vitality, there is salvation spread to everyone else. And the physician told me, well, it doesn't really work like that. But that's really what Abraham did. To insert one little point of goodness, or to discover and reveal one little point of goodness, and to have that spread in the opposite way of the cancer, have the life spread and permeate what would otherwise be a dead entity. If you think about it, this is not just the quality of Abraham. This is how God treats us too. We mentioned earlier, the Talmud tells us, that Balak merited to have Ruth as a descendant. Why? Because he did a mitzvah. What mitzvah did he do? He brought sacrifices. Why did he bring the sacrifices? To curse the Jewish nation. It doesn't matter. We're not looking at the intentions. Just the deed. It was a righteous deed. It was only a tiny little point of righteousness. His motivation, everything that he was 
trying to do was evil, but he did a mitzvah. And that little point of righteousness, of goodness, as minuscule as it may be with respect, with relation to the entirety of his deed, God finds that point of righteousness and spreads it out and fleshes it out and broadens it until the result is the righteous matriarch of King David, until it's Ruth. So Bilaam is not only the opposite of Abraham, he's also acting against the ways of God. Of course, it made sense. We're told to emulate God. That's what Abraham did. And Bilaam is the opposite. The lesson, of course, for us is that we should try to take the path of Abraham to try to find the point of goodness and to flesh it out to save the sinners of Sodom, to reward the point of goodness of Balak. But Bilaam's the opposite. He is looking for the point of weakness and using that as a little beachhead, as a foothold to spread until there is total destruction. Now, did Bilaam succeed or fail? So if you read the Parsha without any of the commentaries, it seems like he failed. He tried repeatedly to curse the nation, and he came up empty-handed. But at the end of the parsha, there's a plague, a plague that killed 24,000 of our nation. Why was there this plague? Because of the advice of Bilaam. God hates promised unity. Find a way to get them to cohabit with the Moabite women. And then they'll do the idolatry. And that will trigger an unrestrained plague a plague that would kill both good and bad. This is classic Bilaamism. Find a point of vulnerability, find patient zero, find this rogue cell, and spread it until it runs amok, destroying everything, both good and bad. And indeed, absent the heroism of Pinchas, Bilaam's vision would have been consummated. Now, how indeed did Pinchas stop the plague? What is the secret to reversing the avalanche unleashed by Bilaam? So if you look at what Pinchas did, he found that point of vulnerability. He found that point amongst the whole nation of evil, and he nuked it. He excised patient zero. He removed that one cancerous point, and thereby he removed the trigger. Bilaam is always looking for that one point of evil. What happens when you find it? How do you address it? So what Bilaam liked to do was to fan those flames until there was total destruction. And what Pinchas showed us, or what he did, what he exhibited, is the removal of that point of evil, and thereby depriving the inferno of its energy. Pinchas found that cancerous point, and with a scalpel, removed it, and prevented it from spreading. Now, it's interesting. If we study Pinchas and compare what he did to stop a plague, and we compare that with what Aaron did a few weeks ago in Parshish Korach, what he did to stop a plague, we find something really interesting. How did Aaron remedy the plague? Well, he took incense, the Ktoris, and stood between the living and the dead. Now, in the past, we've talked about incense. It's a cocktail of 11 different spices, some of them really good on their own, some of them really rancid and putrid on their own, but the mixture together makes something which is better than any one individual spice on its own. And we've explained in the past 
that the philosophy behind the ketores, behind the incense, is to take the bad and mix it with the right ingredients of the good, resulting in something so aromatically, symphonically pleasant that it uplifts everything and it makes the net result better than any individual spice on its own. And even the spice that on its own is terrible, is rancid, it ultimately contributes towards the final result. So what Aaron demonstrated with the ktores, with the incense, is that he took that point of evil and he defanged it of its evilness. He made it good. He took the bad part, he took the patient zero and made it something which contributed towards the positive smell, the positive aroma, towards being good. Aaron got rid of the plague by taking that point of evil and making it not evil anymore. Positioning it in a way that not only is it not harmful, it's good. It contributes towards the overall aroma. Pinchas had a different way to deal with this point of evil that was unleashing a plague. He isolated it and he removed it. He nuked it. He got rid of the harmful and contagious force and thereby he stopped the plague. Bilam, what he did, is he found the specific point of evil and spread it out until everyone was affected. He took that one moment that God gets angry every day and he tried to spread it everywhere. He took the point of corrosion and artificially encouraged it to permeate the entirety of the thing. Pinchas and Aaron found ways to neutralize the point of evil. And Abraham shows us that there is an opposite way of behaving. And that is to find the specific good point and to spread it. And even when you have an entity, a body that's entirely bad, there is a way to isolate and identify the point of righteousness, of goodness, and use that to spread righteousness and goodness to the entirety of the thing. I think there's a very powerful lesson from this idea. We have Bilam, he takes a point and spreads it. We have Abraham, in the opposite fashion, taking a good point and trying to spread it. And we have God in the episode of Balak offering sacrifices, again, taking one slight point of righteousness and spreading it. And then we have the efforts to contain a bad point, that of Aaron and of Pinchas. All this tells us that a very small trigger can unleash a very big move. And it works both ways. A small sliver of bad can be expanded into a malady that destroys everything. And that's the expertise of Bilam. And once a Bilamian plague is unleashed, there are two different ways to end this plague, like Pinchas, trying to excise the trigger, finding that harmful catalyst and removing it. And like Aaron, converting that bad thing into something good and thus defanging it. But again, there is a positive version of this as well. If a point of a vulnerability can be destructive to the entirety of a thing, a point of light, a ray of light, can illuminate an entire dark world. And I want to read to you a piece from the writings of Rabbi Nachman, the founder of the Breslev Hasidic movement, passed away in 1810. And he was someone who always talked about this idea. This is one of the pillars of the 
Breslov movement is this idea. Even when there's something which is entirely wicked, entirely dark, entirely devoid of anything admirable, find that point. Find that point of goodness, of righteousness. That's the idea of judging others favorably. This is a quote. Even someone who is completely wicked, you have to look. You have to seek. You have to probe to find a point of righteousness. A little bit of good. Find a little bit in a person in which the person is not wicked. And through that, through that little glimmer of hope and light that you find in a very otherwise dark person, through that you can judge them favorably. And through that, you can influence the entirety of that person to bring them back to righteousness. Once you have a little foothold of goodness, of light in a person, and you acknowledge that, and you celebrate that, that can be a stepping stone to eventually transform the entirety of the dark individual into a righteous person. And even if they're really wicked, they're really dark, you have to work really hard, it's not possible that there is no ray of light. They certainly did a mitzvah in their life. And even if the mitzvah wasn't perfect, there was an element, a sliver of that mitzvah, which was devoid of wickedness, which was righteous. And through that, once you have a tiniest little point of goodness within a person, you have a foothold. Now you have something to work off. Now you have something to spread from. You land, get a foothold, get a beachhead. That's the hard part. But once you have something, you have a little piece of real estate in a person that's righteous, now you just expand that. It's much easier to start with something really small. But once you have a foothold, it's much easier to expand it and to transform the entirety of said person to being righteous. And then he adds a powerful point. This is not just with other people. When you look at yourself and you judge yourself and you find all your flaws and all the areas of life where you are lacking and there's so many areas where there's a need for improvement and there's a risk to lapse into melancholy and depression and you have to always be joyous. That too, of course, is one of the great pillars of the Breslov movement. You have to always be joyous. It's a mitzvah to be joyous every day, all the time. And to be very careful to never lapse into depression. And if you look at yourself, and there's nothing redeeming about you. You're full of sin. You're full of contemptible qualities. And you feel that the Yetzirah Sahara is trying to make you fall and wallow in misery, in melancholy, in depression, God forbid, you cannot fall into this. You have to start looking for a point of redemption, a point of righteousness, a point of goodness. No matter how small that point is, that's what you need to find and that's what you need to focus on. It's not possible that you've lived your whole life without doing one mitzvah. It's not possible. And even if you did that one mitzvah and there was all kinds of ulterior motives and you wanted this, you wanted that, you really didn't want to listen to Hashem. There were all these other factors, ulterior motives really at play behind the scenes. Nevertheless, you did a mitzvah. And I promise you, this is my commentary here, the mitzvah that you did though it may have had all these other motivations, it's still not as bad as what Balak did with his mitzvah of offering sacrifices with the intent of genociding an entire nation. If Balak 
who did a mitzvah with the sole intent of trying to kill off a nation of millions, and he was rewarded, God discovered that one point of goodness in his deed, we all have a point of goodness within us. And we have to find that. And that will enliven us. That will give us joy. That will inspire us. And once you have a little point, through that, you could judge yourself also favorably. And you can find a way to expand that one point. Okay, you have one point. Now let's get two points. And so on until eventually you've been transformed. Just as we have to judge others favorably, says Rabbi Nachman, we have to judge ourselves favorably. We have to strengthen ourselves to never fall, to never get down, to never get depressed. To the contrary, enliven ourselves, give ourselves life and vitality and joy because we have something good and redeeming about ourselves. And even though there may be a lot of noise, focus on the little ray of good and hope and light within us. There is a lot of power with one little point. Land that point, land and expand. Okay, let's get to this week's exquisite insight. Are you ready? It's a special one in my opinion. It's one of those exquisite insights that you get the sense there's a lot more there. This maybe could have been its own podcast maybe sometime in the future. But right now it's just an insight. Moab has a problem. Moab has a nation at their doorstep who doesn't seem to follow the normal course of military events. They're winning against these mighty nations and they have to find a solution. So they go to the elders of Midian. And Rashi tells us, this is in verse 4 of chapter 22, Rashi tells us something really interesting. Why do they go to Midian of all places? Midian, of course, that's the place where Jethro is from. That's the place where Moses, Moshe, escaped to in chapter 2 of Exodus, where Moshe was a little boy, and he saw the Egyptian man striking the Hebrew man. He killed the Egyptian man, and eventually it was found out that he killed an Egyptian. And he was wanted for murder, and he escaped and went to Midian, eventually marrying the daughter of Jethro, and only coming back to Egypt after the episode of the burning bush and God commissioning him to go save the nation. So Midian is the place where Moshe came of age. And when Moab was trying to figure out how do we deal with this juggernaut of a nation, they said, well, their leader grew up in in Midian. Let's go to Midian and do some field research. Let's get a scouting report from his hometown and find out and find out and discover what he is made up of. So they went to Midian. And the elders of Midian said, we remember Moshe, we know his whole superpower is in his mouth. If so, says Moab, we're going to hire someone who equally has the power of the mouth. And that's why they hired Bilam. Because he can thwart, he can be the foil of Moshe. So if you study this Rashi, you notice that there are three different points. Number one, they chose to do some field research in his hometown, in the place where he grew up, in Midian. And the people of Midian, the elders of Midian said, well, Moshe's superpower is in his mouth. And that's why they decided to counteract him with someone whose power is also in his mouth. So there are a bunch of obvious questions to this. First of all, we know that Moshe did not grow up in Midian. He grew up in Egypt. It seems to be factually incorrect to say that Moshe grew up in Midian. In fact, when he came, when he came to Midian, he was called an Ishmitsri, an Egyptian man. So why didn't they go to Egypt? Why specifically did they go to Midian? Point number one, put it aside. 
Additionally, point number two, it seems to be inaccurate. Their scouting report of Moshe was that his superpower is his mouth. We know that Moshe's weakness was his mouth. It was Moshe's hamstring. Where in Midian did Moshe exhibit his speaking prowess? In fact, when God says to Moshe, go save the Jewish people, he says, I, how can I do it? I'm hard of speaking. I have a heavy tongue. I have a heavy mouth. Point number two, let's put those off to the side. Here's the insight. Moshe, his superpower is concluded to be his mouth. What's the way to foil him? The Moabites determined that the way to foil someone whose superpower is in his mouth is also with someone whose superpower is in his mouth. You fight fire with fire. If you remember last week, the nation of Edom, when the Jewish people wanted to cross over and they made a request, and the people of Edom came out with their sabers rattling. If you look at Rashi, it seems like they took the opposite approach to the Moabites. That whole back and forth between the Jewish people and Edom was about the Jewish people coming as Jacob and Edom responding as Asaph. So there, they weren't fighting fire with fire. You'll use the power of the mouth. We'll go with someone who has the equal strength of mouth. They were fighting with the opposites. Somehow over here, there is a different philosophy of encountering an enemy Either you find their weaknesses and you try to expose it, you try to exploit it, you try to go with the opposite power, or you find their strength and you try to neutralize it with ever more strength. To me, this is an insight because it seems like there is maybe a lot more here of two different philosophies of how you deal with with an enemy, or at least how our enemies dealt with us. Bilam, you have a superpower of your mouth. You're the right guy to fight Moshe, whose superpower is in his mouth. Whereas Edom last week, they came with a different posture. Oh, you're coming as Jacob. We're going to respond as Asaph. It's an insight. It's like last week, a bit half-baked. But that's okay. It's an exquisite insight, something to think about, something to ponder and cogitate upon and ruminate upon until next week when, please God, I'll have less jet lag and hopefully we get the podcast out a little bit earlier in the week. But you take care. Have a great day. Have an incredible week. Have an exquisite and stupendous and fantastic and splendid and uplifting, and inspiring Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we'll talk again next week. We'll keep the streak alive. As always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.